Um, as you said, I am Dr. Adrian Wooten, a research scientist with the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. You're going to be hearing a lot from me in the opening of this because of two talks this morning. But um, I'm going to get into it first. Um, first talk is so it's setting the stage here with climate modeling and projections and some of the basics therein um, for those who may not be familiar and um, a little bit more depth um, than I would necessarily do. But Oh, well, if I, would, if I were doing with a shorter talk, let's put it that way, um, with this. So we're going to get right into it. There we go. First thing, though, that I want to do is I do want to introduce uh, the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center for those of you who have uh, who are not familiar with us. Uh, just to get to know, we do have several of our staff here with us today, which we're excited that we could be here. And we thank you to the Southwest Research Institute and the Anthropocene Authority for hosting us. Then we're going to get into the climate modeling and the projections themselves with some definitions and talking I mean, about the scenarios, the climate models, and the downscaling. And I do also want to get into, and in line with the theme of today, get into uh, what goes in beyond climate science, if you will, when we're talking about examples of how to use projections um, in different applications and some tips and tricks um, that we have over, over, the, over our experience uh, for using projections and advising others on how to use them. So, first things first, for those of you who are not familiar, CASC stands for Climate Adaptation Science Center. It is a network of nine centers across the United States, um, overseen by our headquarters center in Reston, Virginia, the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. All of them share a common mission in delivering science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. And so each of the CASCs are, it's a pretty unique structure for the CASCs in that we have a USGS arm of, of the CASCs under Department of Interior, and each CASC also is comprised of a consortia of universities and other partners uh, with a headquarters host institution. So it gets to be a really unique uh, set of framework for all of us. A little bit of history and the kind of key points here in that the actual funding to get things going was uh, initially established in 2008 for the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, or what was, or as we were originally named, the Climate Science Centers. Um, in this, in 2009, the official secretary, secretarial order um, from the Department of Interior Secretary Ken Salazar at the time um, was signed to expand the mandate of the National Center and officially establish all the regional centers at the same time. And so over the next few years after that, all of the regional centers would be established with our center, the South Central Climate Science Center at the time, being established in 2012. And the rename came in 2018 when Congress decided to rename one of the centers to the Climate Adaptation Science Centers instead. So a short version of our history. We actually are pretty unique in harnessing both uh, the expertise of federal scientists and university scientists. All of our USGS staff have co-located with us at our host institution um, here, and that's so to help facilitate that partnership between us, but also it helps us to guide the science with our federal partners in planning, and also the federal side provides funding for a lot of, uh, for a lot of the work that we do. Each CASC has a really broad consortium of universities and other institutional partners a lot of those provide training also for early career students, uh, for early career professionals and students, as well as capacity building for the stakeholders in the, in the region that they're in. Our center, the South Central uh, Climate Science Center, is made up of five universities, with the University of Oklahoma being the host institution. We also have Oklahoma State University, Texas Tech University, uh, the University of New Mexico, and Louisiana State University. We are also unique in that we also have two sovereign tribal nations as part of our consortium, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma. And so get a lot of great input from our partners and the tribal nations as well. We have a number of foundational activities that we engage in. Um, starting first with the funding of actionable climate science. So, the USGS side of the CASC in particular is very interested in funding science that has an intentional end use. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about today falls very much in that line of what the CASC would fund. Um, the USGS side of the CASC would fund, and that is what we define as actionable science. It's, uh, it's something that's carried out in collaboration with folks who use that science. The Tribal Engagement Program is another one of the foundational activities of the CASC. We have a number of tribal liaisons who is their primary 
primary duty and responsibility to liaise with the tribes and help provide them the information and guidance that they need for their own climate adaptation activities. We have education and training. A um, number of our staff engage in providing climate 101s and also training activities on how to use the projections um, and very many kinds of early career professional development activities as well for the members of the consortium. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit more about the next one today, so I won't necessarily dwell on that one at this moment. But uh, one of the major baseline activities of what we engage in and consider foundation over climate adaptation in general is the projections and downscaling itself. And in that vein, the final foundational activity is one of the things I engage in alongside of our climate adaptation specialists and tribal liaisons is providing technical assistance for any of our stakeholders who wish to use the climate projections um, at all in our region. So the CASC is blessed with a great leadership that helps facilitate a uh, facilitate our partnership. Um, as, as I said, we have a university consortium that is led um, on our end by OU and our director, Dr. Lynn Pearson, and assistant director, um, Custer, and uh, we're graced today actually with the presence of our USGS leadership, Dr. Suzanne Van Kooten and Dr. Michael Langston, the of course, because they keep renaming you guys from director to whatever your title is now, um, the regional administrator and the assistant <coughs> regional administrator. Um, alongside of that today, I want to also acknowledge and, and um, introduce the other members of the cast who are here today. It's Cody Wynn, who is the operations assistant on the USGS side, and Dr. Dolly Nadia May, who is one of our climate adaptation specialists. So she looks out the outreach and the translation of services. I know Suzanne is recently hired as our new uh, regional administrator, so if you would like, Suzanne, I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to say a little bit. I don't think I need to use the mic. I speak pretty loudly. Uh, I just appreciate the opportunity and the tremendous partnership here with this um, Edwards Aquifer and all of the scientists that are going into this in this effort. I really appreciate the invitation and the tremendous partnership that we have. Um, my background, so this is in my wheelhouse, I think. Um, I'm a hydrometeorologist, a former uh, leader of a river forecast center in the National Weather Service. So I'm a civil engineer, a meteorologist, and coastal restoration. So this is right in my, I think, my wheelhouse along with this very talented team. So I look very much forward to uh, working with all of you and expanding this in our science-based approaches and how we can really apply our climate science here. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for the words. And um, I know, uh, speaking for our university leadership, we very much enjoyed the partnership with the photographer and the, uh, the science that we've been able to produce uh, together. So I, I think they were thrilled. They just, they could not put it in their schedules to come down to join us today. So. But um, as I said, a lot of this leadership and all this work is informed by the climate projections. And so now we can finally jump into the actual meat of this talk instead of all the introductions. I do want to make a point right up front in that climate models versus projections, oftentimes when you're working with projections, you're working with the output of modeling. It's not necessarily the models themselves. So there are several components that go into making climate projections, including the scenarios, or more appropriately, the emissions scenarios the climate models themselves, and the downscaling approach that is used. So, according to the Intergovernmental on Panel on Climate Change, we have two definitions for what climate projections are. There's a more general definition, which is just the description of the future climate and the pathway that leads to it. Um, but more specifically for what we're talking about, the other definition is the model-derived estimates of the future climate. So, Long-term management and planning, as we've been uh, we've been kind of talking about, is going to require, but doesn't already, uh, working with climate projections. And this is an actual example from our in-house projections at the CAS for the city of San Antonio. And so, this would be nice and wonderful if we just had one projection to work with. But this is obviously not the case. More of the time, it looks a lot like this, where we have a wonderful spew of projections to work with and quite a collection in there. It's those three components of projections that give us, I thought y'all would like the jokes. <laughs> That's why I left it in there. <laughs> There's three main 
components of the projections, one of them being associated with the tougher decisions that we have to make um, with human and societal action. Those are reflected in the emissions scenarios. Uh, of course, we have physics involved when we get into the global climate models. Why you should not give science teachers playground duty um, in this particular case. Uh, and the final thing, of course, which is where I actually specialize in a lot of my own research, is in downscaling, the translation of large scale change to what does it mean at local scales. So emission scenarios reflect potential larger scale human actions and trajectories in those societal actions. The graphic on the right is actually, actually comes from one of the papers for actually defining said emission scenarios where they look at the many different components that uh, lead to the larger amounts, of larger amounts of emissions, or the total amount of emissions, we should say, in, in society. This is one example just from uh, the energy sector with, with soil, uh, solar rather, hydro, nuclear, and all the rest in here. Based upon these interconnections, you can ask sort of a what-if scenario. Well, what if we had more oil production, or more solar, or more of this, or more of that? And those potential approaches in those what-if situations are translated into emissions of greenhouse gases, which becomes one of the big inputs into the global climate models, or the climate models, or you may hear me say GCMs. Apologies, there's going to be a lot of acronyms. So, some of you may be familiar with these. This is this is one generation of the emission scenarios. Uh, they are referred to as the representative concentration pathways, or RCPs. The numbers on the end of these, with 2.6 and 4.5 and 6 and 8.5, reflect the amount of radiative forcing on the climate system by 2100, by the year 2100. So basically, the larger the number, essentially, the greater the change in temperature at the global scale. Radiative forcing is itself the change in radiation into the atmosphere that results from an external driver. Um, in this case, such as CO2, essentially it's incoming minus outgoing, and if the number is positive, you can increase in radiative forcing in here, and uh, the larger the positive number, the greater the increase in temperature, essentially. What we're talking about with this is essentially the Earth's energy balance. We're here on the left-hand side, you know, sort of map of that, and in absence of any external drivers to change it, it's pr pretty much in balance. The same amount of energy incoming equals energy outgoing. Where it comes in with human activities and emissions has to do with what these different sources contribute to radiative forcing, um, changing that energy balance and allowing more energy to stay retained in the atmosphere than go out to space, um, and then increase the amount of energy that is retained over time. And that is what's on the right hand side, that is from 1750 to 2099. Uh, 2099, wow! <laughs> 2019, wow, that's an interesting uh, slip today. Um, 2019, the amount of radiative forcing estimated from different uh, greenhouse gases. And there are some negative ones of the things that um, result from human emissions, such as sulfur dioxide, is actually a source of negative radiative forcing, actually contributes to cooling things a little bit. Uh, but of course, the biggest one in there is CO2, methane, and the nitrous oxide and chloro. I can't pronounce it, the CFCs um, in, that, in that particular graphic. So. We're transitioning into a new generation of emission scenarios. These are referred to as the shared socioeconomic pathways. And they're actually really similar in that the numbers, the 2.6, the 4.5, the 8.5, and the 7, which is the new one now, is still representative of radiative forcing. So there is a, if there's a good way to compare back and forth between generations. If it is the same radiative forcing, what they recognized with the SSPs, where they added numbers with the 1, 2, 1 through 5 here, is the idea that there are many different ways that one could reach that level of radiative forcing. So they decided to input different scenarios in here, but get to the same radiative forcing. But as you can see on the right-hand side, there's actually many of them, but that list of four on the left-hand side is what is, uh, is what is the primary focus of the sixth assessment report and what is used in most downscaling efforts. So regardless of the emission scenarios and how they're created, though, you have basically estimates of what those different emissions would look like over time from those scenarios. This is from the SSB, so it's actually a great graphic from, uh, from the sixth assessment report showing the different trajectories of greenhouse gases over time under those various SSPs. But what that all translates into is those are used as inputs into the climate models, and the climate models, in essence, give us a sense of if this is the way <coughs> that uh, things unfold, this is how the climate may respond to that. 
And so that's what this graphic is, is actually global surface temperature change um, out to the end of the century from, from the sixth assessment report. You can get a sense of those kinds of things and how they translate into the climate models. Mm -hmm. We don't have to just look at this on the global scale, though. We can start to look at it also in San Antonio. So this is actually that same graphic from before, but all the spaghetti speed of lines, but now we're breaking it down. Um, the older projections were done with RCPs, um, so there's going to be a little bit of a difference that way. But same idea, you can start to see where those emission scenarios play into the projections. The second component being the global climate models themselves, and as I mentioned before, climate is all about physics. Um, and here we're talking about this. All of the models, all the global climate models share a same fundamental basis. Conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, the ideal gas law, all those kinds of fundamental things that you've learned are all the same between the many global climate models that, that exist. Uh, and those equations are then converted into a form that computers can easily solve. The global models, though, are not just made up of those fundamental equations, they are also made up of physical, physical mathematical representations of all of these different processes here on the right hand side. Be it uh, changes in the hydrologic cycle, or the biosphere, land surface, sea ice, or interactions between various components of atmosphere and ice, or atmosphere and ocean, what have you. The climate models are 3D models also. They are run globally, as the name suggests, so you know, latitude and longitude, but also with an atmosphere component, go from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, and all the way down from the ocean surface to the very, very bottom as much as you can there. It's important to recognize um, the climate models themselves are not necessarily meant to give you a detailed prediction. They are meant to give you a reasonable projection. What do I mean by that? It's kind of meant to tell you a little bit about what's going on with the climate, or what may happen with the climate 50 years from now. It is not meant to tell you what will happen exactly on this day 50 years from now. Um, there's a very big difference there. But models themselves take all of these equations, start from one time step, calculate everything, um, across that grid and then proceed to the next time step and repeat. And they're giving us estimates of temperature, precipitation, and all the rest from the global climate models. Over time, the complexity of the global climate models has increased dramatically. So in the 1960s were when weather forecast models and climate models came to be, um, and they were very simplistic with mostly just an atmosphere component and a very rough one. By the time the first assessment report was written um, for the IPCC, there was a lot of advancement in starting to include things like sea ice and volcanoes and some of the other kinds of features. But over time, since the assessment reports have begun with the IPCC, uh, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and most recently the sixth one, there's been incredible leaps forward in the number of physical processes that are included in the global models, new processes being added, and all the processes being refined as our understanding improves. And so this, this is a really great thing to see as we've been moving forward in time. The other thing that has improved dramatically in the last uh, 60 years working with climate models is that the resolution, the size of each of those little grid boxes, has also improved dramatically from the first assessment report to the fourth now. There's not an updated image for this because they haven't done much beyond the fourth with improving the resolution. Um, but this is kind of attributed to the notion that well, thank goodness your computing power has increased, um, that you can do a lot of improvements and make finer resolution models and represent more physical processes as a result. So with all that said, you may be wondering, we have so many different models. Um, each one of these circles on here represents a uh, modeling center in the, in the world that uh, contributed at least one global climate model to the, to the sixth assessment report. Um, or the couple model intercomparison project phase six, if it work as you will, or CMIP six. Um, and there are a lot of them in CMIP six in total. There's 100 global climate models to work with, which is pretty impressive, um, given where we were 60 years ago. The reason uh, for that comes back to this particular graphic and the number of processes. We are adding new physical processes as our understanding improves. But of course, as you identify and try to mathematically model that process, there's our, there are competing theories for how that process works and how it should be modeled. And this is one of the primary things that leads us to have many climate models to work with because each of those competing reasons for reasons and theories for how a process works can be uh, translated into mathematical modeling components and incorporated into separate global climate models. So 
this is the reason for that. It is a very good reason for that. As I said, though, to make it perfectly clear, the fundamentals are all the same. We're talking primarily about processes where we're still, still um, making a greater understanding of how that process works. Oh, is it going to play? Oh, it may not play. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. That's supposed to be a video. That's what that is supposed to be. One of the ways we go about evaluating the final models, because obviously we don't want to evaluate them for do they represent exactly this event that happened, because that's not what they were designed to do. They're designed to represent the climate. But one of the ways we look at evaluating them is assessing do they actually place things in the, in the appropriate positions for what we know them to be physically. For example, the intertropical convergence zone here, is it appropriately where it should be? Are we having frontal systems and hurricanes show up where they should be at the right times of year? Not that Hurricane Arbor or what have you exists in exactly the place it existed in the observed record and things like that, but that something Irma-like or the appropriate frequency of hurricanes appears. And so this is actually from a global model simulation, uh, the CCSM model, I believe, can't read? Yeah. Um, that is produced by the National Centers for Atmospheric Research. So this is one way that we look at it and gives us confidence in seeing a lot of the physical processes that we know exist in the real world to be represented um, in the global models that you're going across um, across here and at the scales that, that are appropriate to the model. Another way we can look at it is because we're talking about a model, we can look at whether or not the models do capture historical temperatures as well and the trends of temperature. Um, and this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but what I like about this right here is the black line is observed. Uh, changes in global temperatures, and this brownish beige here is the models simulated human and natural influences at the same time. And what we can see with this is that you cannot actually match observed changes in temperature without incorporating both human and natural influences into the models. So that was that part with the global models. But of course, because we have so many different global models to use, this is where I can start adding more lines <laughs> to the projected change here. And I just added a few, for example, from, from, the, uh, from the example in San Antonio um, we were talking about before. And so you can start to see, when you're talking about emission scenarios, okay, so three emission scenarios can be put into 100 models. So maybe we have 300 simulations of things to work with. Um, and it grows, grows pretty quickly after that with the other component where I spend a lot of my time is uh, on downscaling. Downscaling is a modeling process that helps to translate large scale changes to local scales and falls into two main categories. Um, there's a dynamic approach and a statistical approach, I'll get into more of that in a moment. But the idea here is that we know that even though the resolution of the global models is coarse, there's still some local physical effects that are really important, whether it be from the topography, or the proximity to the coastline, or what have you. Downscaling is about preserving those particular local physical effects and how do they interact with the changing climate. Downscaling is also about correcting biases quite often, particularly in the statistical downscaling um, side of things. But also for our purposes as a CAST with our stakeholders, a lot of times 100 kilometer resolution data just isn't useful for what anybody wants to do in an application. So downscaling helps us make those projections more useful to our stakeholders who are planning in small areas. The Edward Topper for being a great example of that. Um, there's also other pieces we've used for the Red River, the Canadian River, um, for Louisiana, for many of our many of the uh, folks in the Howard region. Now, first, I want to provide an example of why downscaling is so is so useful and so needed. And I'm going to use actually Puerto Rico to do that. Um, Puerto Rico is near and dear to me because that's actually where I did a lot of my dissertation research. So. This is the island of Puerto Rico. On the right hand, side, oh, sorry, on the left hand side, the island of Puerto Rico is overlaid with these grid boxes that roughly uh, are 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, the resolution of a typical global climate model. So essentially, one number per box in here, one number per box. And the right hand side of this is a topographic map of the island of Puerto Rico with some mountains here as well as a bunch of mountains here in the in the western part of the island. Now, why is it a problem that there's only two numbers to represent all of Puerto Rico? If you're lucky, if it's coarser, it may be a number. And the model, well, there may be a lot of ocean there, too, at the same time. So it's going to be interesting for some of the global models. Puerto Rico is a very dynamic changes in uh, ecology and in climate across the island. So 
with where it is in the Caribbean and topography, combination of wind flows. This is actually what portions of this island look like. And I will point out, Juanica and El Duque here are about 60 or 70 miles apart. <laughs> so you go from a pretty arid desert-like condition to a rainforest in the space of about 70 miles. Um, Utado is in about the middle, so you can kind of see the change in, in vegetation that results. The vegetation is that kind of in Puerto Rico because of the precipitation and flow of the island. The flow over Puerto Rico generally is east to west because of where it is in the Caribbean, it's an east to west flow. But one of the things that happens is because where there's a mountain right in here that is distinctly tall enough, you have a lifting force right there on that side of the mountain, and that results in a tremendous amount of orographic precipitation, which is why this particular area in Puerto Rico gets about 170 inches per year of rainfall or more, which is pretty damn dramatic. <laughs> On the opposite side of the island is a little bit more complex. The mountains right here are in the middle, and they do disrupt the background flow enough that what happens is you get a lifting force more so on this side of the island and a suppressive force on that side of the island. And as a result, you can see the very dry southern portion of the island of Puerto Rico. Um, all of that is reduced to two numbers in a global model, and hence the reason for the need for downscaling. Um, because this is actually Bonica, right down here, one of the driest portions of the island. Um, Utuado is here in the middle, with its much more lush vegetation, and of course this would be El Yoke, all the way here on the northeast side. Incidentally, the only rainforest in the U.S. National Forest Service system is El Yoke National Forest, here on the northeast side of Puerto Rico, which is a beautiful forest if you get to go. Of course, we don't have to just look at Puerto Rico, we can also look at the United States itself. This is an example with 200 kilometer data for the, for the United States. Normally, we would know that there is pretty dramatic changes in temperature, because it's a temperature map. Um, here in the Rocky Mountains, you can't even see the Rio Grande Valley in here because of how coarse it is. And I'm sorry for those of us like me who live on the, lived on the East Coast for a while, the Appalachians are kind of missing um, at this point. There should be a temperature change and elevation there. Downscaling allows us to convert this kind of an image more to this kind of an image where you can actually start to see so much of the features that we know are already there because of the topography and the proximity to the shoreline. And now you can see the warm area of Florida a lot more clearly with the proximity to the coastline and the land mass sticking out there, as well as the many changes in temperature over the very short distances that are the, that are the result of um, the topography in the western part of the United States. And finally, there's at least some semblance of the Appalachians in this one. It's not the finest that can be done now, this 25 kilometer resolution, but it provides a great illustration. As I mentioned, there are two main types of downscaling that we deal with. First of them is the physically based um, dynamic downscaling that is regional, involves regional climate modeling. The second is what's referred to as statistical downscaling, which is where I spend more of my time. It is empirically based and makes use of statistical techniques. So dynamic downscaling, I believe somebody else is probably talking a little bit more about this later, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But dynamic downscaling involves what's called regional climate models. And regional climate models are essentially smaller, sort of the smaller versions of a global model. It runs in the same way with lots of uh, lots of physics and physical representations and what have you. But what it does is, for example, it will run a simulation over just this area rather than the other way and take the global model's information as an input into it, um, instead of taking the emission scenario directly as an input. Um, and then it will run a simulation over this area, and that's actually what's shown on the right-hand side here. With regional climate modeling, you can do something that is also called nesting, whereby you can actually take one outer domain of a regional climate model and run the same model again for even smaller area and keep on going. The benefit being that as you shrink the domain size, it makes it much more computationally feasible to go to a finer and finer resolution. So that would be a general overview of what dynamic downscaling is. Statistical downscaling is a little different, uh, for sure, because it's not based on physics as much as it is based upon relationships built statistically between observed data used to train that statistical relationship and the global climate model simulation data in a historical period. So where you have historical observations, you also have 
historical simulations of each of the global models. That relationship is then used with those future projections from the global models to essentially give you, if you had observations in the future, what would they look like? Um, so at its utter conceptually simplest, um, you might think of it as simple y equals x plus b, um, where y is our observations in this case, and the GCM is our predictor. Um, of course, there's many more complicated techniques than that, but this provides a great sort of conceptual way of thinking of it. But this is the limitation with statistical downscaling. It does require observation data and a long record. Usually, about 20 years of observations are required at least to uh, to help make that robust, that statistical relationship very robust. There is quite a range. I lost track. Somebody, somebody at the National Cast asked me a while ago, about 10 years ago, I think, to uh, basically catalog all the downscaling techniques that exist at the time, and I stopped somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 when I was reading papers, so there's a lot of different statistical approaches to doing this. Um, at its utter complete simplest of techniques is what's called the delta method, or it's also referred to as a change factor approach, um, where you literally just take the change signal of a global model and add it to your observation data set, and there you go, you have, um, you have a representation of what the future might look like. An example with an intermediate approach is you can actually do this with principal components analysis um, also, or, uh, or some other similar kinds of methods. Increasingly, um, we're actually starting to see more AI being used, and particularly with artificial neural networks has been uh, the primary thing with that statistical downscaling. Um, this is actually an example of that from one of the papers in here in terms of how that works with different hidden nodes um, that, that uh, learn essentially the relationship between observation and GCM to give us some downscale precipitation in that case example there. But there are many, many, many different statistical downscaling techniques and many regional climate models for much the same reason as we have many global climate models in that there's not a one best way to do that translation from local uh, from large scale to local scale. Um, there are benefits and uh, benefits and pros and cons to both. There we go. One point I want to make because I have seen this come up so many times in papers is that some folks do think downscaling is interpolation and interpolation is downscaling. That is not true. Um, in this, downscaling is not interpolation. Interpolation is purely about spatial statistics, and while you can certainly use interpolation as part of a statistical downscaling approach, it is not that itself. Um, interpolation generally makes no relationship between a GCM and observations, which is what statistical downscaling does, and there's also no physical relationships involved in interpolation either. That's the dynamic downscaling side. Um, downscaling is meant to resolve those new physical processes, small ones that uh, that we know are there and probably won't go away under a changing climate, like a mountain. I hope I hope climate change doesn't eradicate a mountain. That would be a problem. Um, clouds, thunderstorms, land surface, statistical relationship with the downscaling between trading data and GCM. Um, and also you can have finer scale simulation with the regional climate model. This is lesser known, but I believe somebody's talking about it today. I forget um, myself, but there's a combination um, approach called hybrid to uh, that hybridizes together statistical and dynamic. So, but because we don't have uh, one standard technique, of course, now you have, what is this, three scenarios, 100 global models, and 40 or more different downscaling techniques. You can see how that blows up very quickly when you start adding more downscaling techniques on top of it to get to that simulation, uh, simulated set of projections. And of course, all together, we end up with quite the range of projections um, for the city of San Antonio, this is just from our in-house data set, a little of the other stuff we'll be talking about next. So, this is where we get to the fun stuff for me as we get into translation. Traditionally, climate modeling was a research tool to learn about the climate system, and it still is. It is something that we use that for. Um, and our focus is often on temperatures, on rainfall, on climate sensitivity, and a few things that are important to me as an atmospheric um, scientist, climate scientist, but it is very true that in the last 20 years, a lot more usage, there's been a lot more usage of the projections from climate models outside climate, assess, uh, outside climate science. And this includes vulnerability and impact assessments, adaptation planning, decision making. And there's often a focus on more than just temperatures and rainfall. Because um, there is more than just temperature and rainfall that affects a lot of uh, different things, be it in an aquifer system or an ecosystem or, um, or an agriculture. 
So impact assessments, derived variables, my current concern with a lot of these, of course, is the proper use of said projections. Um, with these kinds of things, I lost track of the number of papers I've seen where projections have been used somewhat incorrectly, and it leads to maladaptive decision making when they are used incorrectly. But it's important to remember that climate projections themselves are great tools and visuals. They can feed into other models, yes, but um, they are also great tools and visuals on their own. When we're talking about climate, we're talking about typical weather, the frequency of extremes. And of course, then you have to think about, for us, when we're talking about the translation between the climate science and climate modeling, to why the heck does this even matter to see how the climate will change? And just some visual examples to kick things off here. Changing climate means changing the frequency of droughts, for instance, the frequency and intensity of droughts, of course, with agriculture and the ecosystems alike. You can all imagine for the aquifer, um, groundwater recharge is, of course, a concern there. Talking about changing the growing season length, potentially, which also has impacts for ecosystems and agriculture alike in the United States and across the world. Change the frequency and intensity of heavy rains as you change the climate. Um, so obvious, obvious concerns there for life and property. Um, involved in that. And of course, just changing average high temperature, well, and I, I don't know if y'all heard, but it's been bloody hot this summer. Um, <laughs> so that would be a good example for public health concerns, just in general. Um, what follows is actually some examples of how the projections have been used in, in other applications. So starting first, one of the things we do at the CASC is, of course, assisting with species status acceptance of the Fish and Wildlife Service. This little bug right here is the American bearing beetle, which is a, an endangered species um, that is uh, managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we provide assistance, assistance on the climate side. What's nice about the bearing beetle is that it actually, um, it actually has a very direct and simple relationship with the climate. And that's one of the things we have to figure out when we're doing the applications. What is the climate influence that's involved here that you can even use the projections at all? The American bear beetle is actually affected a lot by the temperature of the soil. If it's a very hot soil, um, it tends to not thrive very well, and the habitat becomes less suitable for it. Now, as it happens, this is lucky for us because the air temperatures have a very direct and straightforward relationship with the soil temperatures. And so, based upon the air temperatures, we can say something about how the soil temperatures are going to change and therefore also give some guidance to Fish and Wildlife Service on um, potential impacts to the American burial beetle, which is important for them for listing and delisting decisions as it is an endangered species. Um, and it all trickles down from there with uh, management of the landscape. Other species are, shall we say, much more, um, much more complicated, let's put it that way, um, in politeness here. Oh, sorry about that. So this is one great example of looking at the projections range of change in here, and that's, in this case, it's all getting warmer, but we can also get a sense of exactly how much warmer <coughs> in different parts of Oklahoma where that very beetle is present. So it's helpful for us as we do our informative work with the Fish and Wildlife Service. A much more complicated species to deal with is the whooping crane, and in part it's so complicated because it's a migratory bird. Um, it actually flies along these two pathways in our region, of course, it flies along what's called the Central Flyway um, on its migratory patterns from, from southern Texas all the way up to northern Canada, where it is nice and cold, I would presume, um, at this point. <clears throat> uh, but it also has a secondary, a secondary um, flight path right in here, actually, um, in the Midwest from southern Florida. God bless you. <laughs> um, so it actually becomes much more complicated because it depends upon the timing of first leaf and first bloom are the things it needs to feed on at the different points in its migration path going to be present for it to be able to be in that location at that time. And so it becomes a bit more complicated because now we're talking about a really tangled web of things. Um, when we're talking about the whooping grain, because of course it is dependent on first leaf and first bloom, which gives us a sense of the other things that it needs, is that going to be available too? And those things are dependent upon things like the warm spells in the winter and early, uh, in the late winter and early spring, as well as what's called accumulated growing degree hours 
Um, and those two things are then also themselves dependent upon the daily high and low temperatures in a given area. So it becomes a bit more complicated to work with because you need all of that also for many different locations because of the being um, a migratory species. And so that has been the subject of several studies. It's a good example here with the central flyway and looking at growing degree hours, in this case, and projected historical values and projected shade is, of course, generally speaking, greater. Number of growing degree hours suggests possibly an earlier um, first date, uh, date of first leaf and first bloom. And that makes for some interesting challenges in how do you manage that particular species as well. Um, this is one particular example. There are actually many, 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 many particular examples um, that, you can, that you can see in the literature. Um, for example, I grew up in Maryland, so I'm, of course, of course, concerned about the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Well, of course, you can take the projections and run them in a hydrology model, for example, and get a sense of ch stream flow hydrology changes um, in different parts of the country and around the world. Uh, another example, just in terms of infrastructure, this is a concern with larger amounts of increased heat and uh, very hot temperatures, of course, may bend railroad tracks and have to it disrupts the transport of uh, people and goods across the country. So that is a prime concern there. Uh, I did my degrees in North Carolina. I don't know if y'all know, we're known for our peaches. So one of the things we're known for is our peaches. So yeah, what's going to happen with uh, the peaches, which is a concern there. So those are all examples in literature. I could keep on going for, for a while about um, using projections in terms of applications. But there are also many tips and tricks I would recommend if you are going to use the projections yourself and you haven't before, um, I do very strongly recommend working with a climate scientist and modeler because um, you can help avoid some of the typical pitfalls, um, such as misinterpretations of data or, um, well, basically misinterpretations of data. Um, if you do choose to work with a climate scientist or modeler, um, please don't ask which, meeting, which one is the best. Please don't do that. Um, the analogy that I like to use with that is that's like walking into a car dealership and asking car salesmen which of the cars that are there is the best one. Well, I have no idea what in the world you want to use it for. So I can't give you that advice about which is the best if you're just going to walk in and ask me that. Um, as I said, this doesn't really help us help you. We need to have some more than that. Um, there's a lot of questions to ask first, and so that's, that's what's going to be next here. So, Questions to ask for yourself before you get into working with projections. Um, what do you need it for? Simple, but a very, very important question. What do you need projections for to begin with? Uh, what is important to you about this kind of thing that we need the projections? That goes back to the why does climate change kind of matter? The frequency of droughts having effects on this. Why does it matter? Um, what are you trying to assess? What's the decision that's, that you're trying to be made? And, um, for what, for where, for why kind of thing. All those kinds of questions become important. The when side is a particularly interesting one because it's about the decision time horizon. For example, um, infrastructure is often meant to be built in to last for 100 years. Well, okay, that's the time horizon you start considering with projections, what goes on in the next 100 years, and is what you put in now going to be able to uh, stay up in 100 years, if you will. Um, and what do you already know? Now, what I mean by this is, you know, what about the climate is important is there are situations, and it's totally fine that we worked with this before, where maybe there's not a whole lot of research that's been done on how the climate affects something that you're interested in. We had this problem with uh, the plain spotted skunk is a good example, because I, I helped them up with a species of status assessment for that. When I asked the question, they were like, oh, well, we think it's this, but we're not sure. And that's totally fine. That just means there's more fundamental research that needs to be, needs to be done. It doesn't mean we can't work with projections. Um, just make sure to have the appropriate caveats. And I mention all of this because all of that and more will influence what's best for you. Because knowing what you need in kind of relationships with the climate, with your system or species or what have you, becomes important because then I can recommend which, which data sets, which sets of projections have those variables to begin with, but also which ones represent them to the best possible ability. Um, things to keep in mind, good on you if you get the movie reference, um, in here. I know it's very tempting for folks to just use projections because someone else used it, just grab something off the shelf, um, your buddy used it in a different project, 
doesn't mean it was necessarily the best choice for you to make for whatever application in there. So don't just pick it because somebody else you know used it. Um, don't just pick it also because it's readily accessible. There's a lot of data sets that are very easy to access. Um, but again, same kind of rules apply. Was it actually created in a way that you can use it? Was it actually, can it actually do what you need it to do? Um, I think this kind of goes without saying from the last slide, but think very carefully on what you need and what you need it. Um, and for the final kind of thing here, I, I love putting memes in my talks, okay? <laughs> um, keep calm and consult in climate science. This is why we're here. This is why a lot of the casts are here. Um, we will help you figure out what you need quite often. This is part of, part of my role, particularly in technical assistance, but also as one of the subject matter experts in our office is to help out with that. Um, we help to answer questions about them. I know Hakan and I have gone back and forth many, many times about, about the projections and how they're created. Um, navigating data pitfalls and challenges. This is one of the other things that we do because, um, as I said, it, it can be easy to misinterpret things or just grab a random day in 2050 and see, oh, that's, that's what that's going to be like. That's not the right way to work with it. Um, and likewise, help it out with interpretation also is one of the things that we'll do as experts in the data. The final thing I want to mention is sort of my catch-all somewhat disclaimer, if you will, because um, I mean, data can't really tell you absolutely everything. Climate projections can't tell you absolutely everything. What they can tell you is how the climate may change. And the extensions with that in hydrology and the rest can tell you how other aspects of things you're interested in may change. For those of you making decisions or looking at other things there, I am, they can't tell you anything about risk tolerance, um, vulnerabilities, and all those kinds of things. So, that is entirely up to those who make use of those projections. So, based upon the projections and the extensions to that, I always recommend you ask what if questions. If this kind of thing happens, well, what does it mean for me, for my system, for the things I'm most concerned about? And that is the close of talk number one. I didn't lose my voice yet. <laughs> so, let's have some questions since we have some time. <laughs> Um, certainly have time for questions, please, uh, anybody? Yes. Uh, so as you, um, as the climate adaptation centers do regionally downscale climate projections, uh, you know, there are other entities doing different things uh, with regard to uh, using climate data to inform uh, you know, future precipitation. One of the biggest efforts I think that's going on right now is the uh, NOAA Atlas 15, uh, they are which, okay. yeah. which basically is looking at trends historically. There are non-stationary trends, and then there's also a future climate component to that where they're trying to use, you know, CMIP 5, CMIP 6, whole suite of things. Um, my question is, as as the climate adaptation centers do these regionally downscale, uh, hopefully more. Um, well, hopefully they're better, right? Hopefully better <laughs> uh, climate projections. Um, you know, is there a way for you all to interact with with NOAA? To That's a very good question. Get that in the engineering community because you know, it's it's one thing from a planning standpoint when you're looking at trends, but when you take that and generate a hundred year rainfall. If that 100 year rainfall changes by one inch, that's a huge infrastructure decision. So uh, I was wondering what were your thoughts on that and what are the kinds of interactions that are going on between different agencies to be able to raise those things? Sorry, it's a long winded question. Oh, no, 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 that's a, that's a great question. Um, and it's a very fair question because, of course, we could get concerned about there being fragmented um, fragmentation in the science community, but that that is not the case. Actually, in my role, one of the things I do is to uh, liaise and discuss with NOAA, with NASA, with all of the different centers, of course with our sister CASCs, to uh, to make sure we are talking about those kinds of things and providing information and guidance and going back and forth with NOAA. Um, one of my longtime collaborators has actually been uh, Keith Dixon, who's at NOAA GFDL, so we go back and forth on a regular basis. Um, so there are a lot of those interactions and making sure we point out um, to each other even that, well, hey, I think you've got a problem over here with this thing that's not working right. Or, Oftentimes, we find issues with the, we, 
when we find issues and things to help improve the modeling, oftentimes in working with stakeholders, you end up thinking about the modeling in ways that we didn't before. Um, and so that helps us find things to make improvements. So yeah, we do go back and forth. That's part of our role as a boundary organization in general, is that um, we will go back and forth with all the fundamental long learners and like to make sure that they know about things we're hearing, but also to provide some input for them on things to improve. Um, and make sure that we're all consistent to what we're providing. Yes? How many, do you have any projection of how much data on statistical downsizing models it would take for funds? Yes. Just because it's for the camera, too. How many, do you have any estimate of how many years of data on a statistical down modeling we would look at to look at where the model is working fairly well and to make adjustments? Because it seems to me Modeling is modeling, and so your this statistical modeling is, has to have some length of time, you know, to see how well it does and select out the models. So, have any idea about the time frame of that, for example, in San Antonio or Central Texas? Yes. So, general rule is there should be at least 20 years of data that you look at to both uh, to both training and to validate. The, the data. So there is a there is a cross validation procedure that we do with statistical downscaling that looks at uh, roughly the same length that we use in training, and oftentimes it's twofold cross validation: train in one period and then run on another, and then train in a reverse period and run on the other on the again to get a sense of how well it performs with the statistical downscaling. So it's at least 20 years. It's preferentially more than that um, to get to. Oftentimes, um, oftentimes it will be at least 30, if not 50 years of, of data, which is why it does make it difficult at times to do variables beyond the temperatures and precipitation because they're the longest running observation data sets that we have. Awesome, yes? I have a question. Uh, so how is the like uncertainty you know, to uh, minimize you know, propagations of errors you know, for your downscaling from GCR to regional scale? If I understand. Well, uncertainty analysis? Or? Oh, yes. There's, there's definitely an uncertainty analysis that happens. So, um, in, in our shop, one of the things that I use is a variance decomposition approach where I can see um, exactly what percentage of the uncertainty is associated with which components. So, we know which to target in attempting to approve um, modeling efforts and what have you. There are others who different do uh, different kinds of approaches, but yes, there is there are certainly a lot of those kinds of approaches for doing uncertainty analysis and addressing those kinds of questions. Um, yeah, I think that answers your question. Thank you.